If you can't tell from my username, I am somewhat of a Star Wars fan. I love basically every part of this series, and yes, that does even mean some weak spots like the sequel trilogy and even the holiday special. I just can't get enough of this universe. It has such an expanded collection of lore, both canon and non-canon, that would literally take me years to consume if I started now. Like, seriously, this backlog of content has been forming since 1977. There are heaps of novels, games, comics, movies, and TV shows. But, interestingly, up until a couple years ago, there has never been an attempt at an official Star Wars anime production. Now, I'm a big weeb myself. So this was something I've been dreaming of for a long while, especially considering the 3D animated shows like Clone Wars, Rebels, and even Resistance were all heavily inspired by anime. But I did see the problems that could be present with an anime production in the Star Wars setting. Would it be a movie? A TV show? What studio would make it? What era would it be set in? These questions kind of made it seem like a Star Wars anime would be impossible to produce, as there were just too many factors to consider. However, Star Wars Visions basically solved that problem by instead handing over the rights to multiple studios to produce a single or couple of episodes each that aren't meant to connect to each other. This way, we could get multiple different takes of the Star Wars world through an anime lens. A sampler platter, if you will. To no surprise, it was a big success. With one of the episodes in particular, The Duel, being nominated for an Emmy, which is just insane. A second season is coming later this year, and I'll admit, I'm pretty excited. All of the episodes have such unique animation styles and directions. Even the weaker ones like Akakiri or Tatooine Rhapsody I still found myself enjoying. However, the best of them are definitely The Duel, The Elder, and The Ninth Jedi. All of which I could totally see being turned into full series. However, while I do think these were all good episodes, I didn't find myself diving deeper into them and discussing their themes and characters. Except for one. There was one that I loved above all the others, one episode that I think perfectly handled not just the idea of a Star Wars anime, but more importantly, a Star Wars story. You know the title of the video, today we are going to be talking about The Village Bride by Studio Citrus. Now there are a couple things I want to get out of the way quickly. First, I actually have only watched one other Studio Citrus production. With others like Kamikaze Dogma and Studio Trigger, I knew them from the 3D JoJo openings and things like Kill a Kill and more recently Cyberpunk Edgerunners. However, Studio Citrus have only put out a couple shows I could really call bangers. Those being The Rising of Shield Hero and Made in Abyss. I've never seen the funny Raccoon Girl anime, but a friend of mine has been watching Made in Abyss with me. And while it is really well animated and the story is impactful, it just doesn't really evoke the same feelings as The Village Bride. So, unlike what I would do if I was covering any other episode on this list, I'm actually not going to be bringing up their prior work too much in comparison. Second, when they announced Star Wars Visions, a big part of the marketing was that this was going to be the studio's unique vision. AKA, none of these shorts are actually canned to the main Star Wars timeline like the movies and 3D animated TV shows are. Some, like The Duel and The Twins, actually leaned into this as an advantage by creating whole new universes inspired by the Star Wars story, while others like Tatooine Rhapsody and The Elder instead try to make sure their story could theoretically fit canonically in the Star Wars universe by not contradicting anything. The Village Bride is one of those episodes that could be plopped into the series no problem, and might even call back to previous events. So I'm going to treat it like it is canon for this video, in the hopes that one day it might be. Star Wars canon is known to take from non-canon sources from time to time. Maybe we can see some of the things from this episode in the future. Or maybe the episode itself could be canon at some point. Either way, for now I'm treating it like it is just another part of the story. Alright, now let's get into the amazing. The Village Bride on the surface has a relatively simple story. A young Jedi survivor of Order 66, who only goes by the first letter of her name, F, meets with an old friend of her master, Vaughn, on a remote planet not surveyed by the Empire. Throughout her time on the planet, she learns about their customs and finds out that pirates plan to take the granddaughter of the village chief as hostage. After some convincing, she then saves the village and leaves on another adventure. But 3PO, you might be asking, you just gave away the entire story of the episode in a single paragraph. Why would you do that? A good question. And the simple reason is that this is a simplistic story. But all of the stories of visions are simplistic. 
It's how they're elevated that matters, and for the village bride, a basic understanding of the story just isn't enough to truly understand the appeal. You can tell immediately that the team did some research on the Star Wars universe by sprinkling in important details to add to the background. In particular, how in the beginning, Vaughn mentions how the planet is out of view of the Empire. Then shortly after, we see a probe droid destroyed on a pike, the same kind Vader used in The Empire Strikes Back to survey Hoth. That's a really nice detail that ties into the main Star Wars world so perfectly. I also love how the pirates are using reprogrammed battle droids to inflict fear upon the village, which nicely ties into how the Separatists during the Clone Wars stripped the planets of its resources, already inflicting so much pain on its citizens. And now it seems like history is repeating itself, but with a different threat. Oh, and while it's a small factoid, I love that Matthew Wood came back to do his iconic battle droid voice from the Clone Wars. It lends the story to fitting more naturally into the main canon. Even how in the ending where F is leaving an Ark Starfighter used during the Clone Wars, since it was most likely the ship she used to escape during Order 66. This 17 minute episode has more connective tissue to the other movies and TV shows that makes complete sense than the entire first season of Star Wars Resistance. It really shows what good writing and attention to detail can get you, you know? From the first seat, you get engrossed in a version of the Star Wars universe that looks like it leaped off a painting. The art style chosen almost looks like a watercolor at times, with only the characters having thicker borders to make them pop up from their surroundings, while the setting almost looks like fine strokes of a paintbrush. It differentiates itself from the other episodes while presenting gorgeous landscapes. The music alone makes this an amazing experience. Nabuko Toda and Kazuma Jinochi deserve so much credit for an awe-inspiring main theme and score. It feels operatic and mythical and at home in the Star Wars universe. The setting alone sets the tone perfectly for, yes, what's on the surface is a simplistic story, but the thing is, the true story is what's going on behind the scenes, with the main heroine we're following. F, our main character, is a victim of severe trauma and PTSD. We learn within the episode that her master was either born or was close to this planet, and that he was killed in front of her eyes. Most likely, this was during Order 66, but it wasn't clearly shown. The episode chooses not to make it explicit how he died, but does point out how F is in mental pain because of these memories. Flashes of a red lightsaber and a horrible screeching sound play in her mind over and over, every time she closes her eyes. It also seems like she's cut herself off from the Force and has been covering her face, a mask to hide who she truly is. At this point, she has little to no allies or people looking out for her. No master, no order, nothing. She does have Vaughn, however, a close friend of her master, her only ally left. The reason why he called for her to come to this planet is because of the people living there. The people in the village know of the Force, but call it Majina. Instead of manipulating it like a Jedi, like using it for telekinetic abilities or manipulating people's minds, they use it to connect to nature. They can replay the memories of their world and take in its beauty at any time, or witness the events that partially destroyed it. The people, in particular Haru, who just got married to her new husband Asu, show a deep connection to the world they inhabit and how the cycle of life works. There is a line Haru has with watching the sunset that still sticks with me, even now, talking about how the sun has been rising and setting long before they step foot on their soil, and will keep rising and setting long after they're gone. To them, dying isn't a scary concept, it's a natural part of life that will happen to everyone at some point. So Haru offering herself as collateral to the pirates in place of her grandfather makes complete sense. To her. Saving the village and the people are all that matter to her. As long as she's with Asu, she's fine with potentially joining the Force, or as she calls it, being one with the Majina. Seeing her willingness to throw away her life, her lack of fear, is what makes F do a bit of introspection. Something about this episode I'll always love is how they don't try to say, and then she got better. Because no, that's not how trauma works. It doesn't just go away. It sticks with you and is always something you have to deal with. Instead, F takes the all-important first step. Earlier in the episode, Vaughn mentions how he doesn't care about her little cord, so why should she? 
In the Jedi Order, having a small, longer bit of hair tied into a cord is supposed to symbolize your rank as a Padawan who isn't a full Jedi yet. For other Padawans that survived Order 66, like Cal and Kanan, they did end up removing their cords earlier before they were knighted, so people couldn't tell what they were. But F kept her cord, still clinging on to her past and refusing to grow. However, here she takes a knife and finally cuts her cord, allowing herself to start the healing process and take action. Along with her cord, she removes her mask, no longer afraid to show her face, no longer afraid to fight. And so, the climax of the episode kicks off. Haru is about to turn herself over to the pirates, and Asu is going with her. I like how as seen before this, we see Haru and Asu together preparing for their departure, and we see a thermal detonator on Asu's desk before he picks up a bladed looking weapon. But before he gets any ideas, Haru pulls him back and he leaves the weapons behind. Honestly, the episode does a pretty good job getting me attached to this young couple. You can really feel their love for each other. However, her sister is found attempting a sneak attack by their battle droids right before Haru and Asu leave with the pirates. The battle droids found the same thermal detonator that Asu was about to use on Haru's sister, kind of showing that he wasn't the only one to think of this idea. The pirate leader is about to kill the sister, aims his gun, and fires before the blaster bolt is stopped in midair only to reveal F standing behind the young couple extending her hand, showing she has opened back up to the force. She is no longer frightened, no longer afraid of who she is, and lets her hood down to finally show her face. Like her soul, it's scarred and not perfect, but it will heal over time. And with a famous line, THE famous line, with a new spin, her faith of the Jedi and herself has been restored. Majina, may you rise, and may the Force be with you. Along with that, we have a pretty cool scene of Vaughn shooting the heads off some battle droids before disabling the rest of them by destroying the command ship, making all but the leader run away in fear. The leader takes Haru at gunpoint and asks what F is, only for her to respond with the final line of the episode, I am a Jedi to which she finally ignites her lightsaber revealing a yellow color, a color that was only ever used by the Jedi Temple Guards, passed down through generations to carry on the legacy of the Jedi. And now like Cal, Ahsoka, Ezra, Rey, and yes, Luke, F now carries the legacy of the Jedi on her shoulders, all of this raising the overall hype, the score, the animation, all leading up to one extraordinary moment. until it's over, in a second. So yeah, is it even really a contest? The Village Bride is undeniably the best of the Visions episodes, in my opinion anyway. While the others all have incredible animation or really intriguing plots, the Village Bride perfectly encapsulates Star Wars all while staying in an anime format. The other episodes are still fantastic, but most of them tend to try and stray away from a traditional Star Wars story. The only other two I can really say are most similar to a Star Wars story would be The Elder and the Ninth Jedi, which follow a story structure used often in the series such as A Master and Apprentice or Call to Adventure. Others like Tatooine Rhapsody or The Twins try something different like following a band across the galaxy or focusing on bombastic fights and stylized movements. The Village Bride, however, chooses to tell a rich, subtle story. It takes a slower pace to appreciate all the little things about life. I will never get tired of hearing this type of story in Star Wars, overcoming grief. While the plot of the episode is extremely basic, it's the underlying message about trauma and taking steps to heal from it that resonate with me. F's mini arc isn't meant to be a final resolution, and her problems aren't fully sorted yet, symbolized by the scar on her cheek. It's not fully healed yet, and that's okay. She took the all-important first step, and now both her scar and her soul can begin to heal. The symbolism and imagery in this episode sticks with me so much. The backdrops and music are just so beautiful and mystical, and lend itself perfectly to an uplifting story about overcoming grief. Honestly, while I don't think The Village Bride in particular can be expanded into a full series, bringing F into more Star Wars projects might be even more beneficial than just making a full series based off of one of these shorts. 
because like almost all of them kind of seem like backdoor pilots for full shows to be made. I want to see F continue to heal and for us to find out more about her and her master. I mean, her voice actress even looks like her. Honestly, while many other stories should probably be kept to that studio and style, F's is the only one I could theoretically see in the main Star Wars series. Now, I get if this wasn't your cup of tea in terms of the episodes that we did get. I mean, I didn't really click with this episode until the second and even more so the third watch. Its themes and imagery took a while to set in for me, but dear lord, am I glad I rewatched this one. Art is subjective, and of course not everyone's opinions are going to be the same as mine, but I don't know man, it's just so awe-inspiring to me. It's a subtle story that requires the viewer to read between the lines at both what's being presented in screen and what's truly going on behind the mask. I love The Village Bride, and I hope we get more Star Wars projects just like it. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Tell me in the comments, I really want to discuss this even more with all of you. And if you haven't watched it yet, or you have watched it and it didn't really click for you, check it out on Disney+. Plus. It's a short 17 minutes long and it is absolutely worth your time. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all later. Bye bye.